Nice story, man. Unfortunately, my phone's giving me a lot of trouble here, so I'm just going to go ahead and improvise and just tell you that our next teller that's coming up, Devin, forgive me, I'm trying to get your bio here, uh, but uh, this is Devin Whitlock. Devin is our next teller. Devin, please come on up and share your story. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hello. Hi, hi. <laughs> the second time I tried to kill myself, I jumped off a bridge. I figured I would hit my head on a concrete embankment, and if that didn't work, I could drown or maybe crack my head open on the bed of the river. I chose to do this on a rainy day after walking for several hours, and what I did not realize was that the rain had caused the level of the river to rise almost double what it normally was. So I missed the concrete entirely and didn't fall nearly as far as I thought I would. So it was more of an awkward swan dive than a suicide attempt. I had crushing debt at the time and a lot of family drama going on. Uh, one part of both of those factors was that my cousin had drunk himself to death earlier that year and to help my aunt offset the cost of that, my parents suggested I buy his car. Uh, in order to afford that, I took out a loan of $10,000 against my 401k. I was working as an unemployment claims examiner for the state of New Jersey at the time, which despite the 401k, is the worst job I will ever have for my entire life. If I somehow end up as the PR guy for a third world dictator, I will prefer that to working for the unemployment office. Yep. <laughs> I update my resume constantly. I put ruins people's lives as a job duty. <laughs> I carved I want to die into my desk. So I was on my way to a job I hated, driving a dead man's car that I couldn't afford, <laughs> when I accidentally skidded on the wet highway pavement, jumped the curb, and rolled twice into a ditch. I didn't get so much as a bruise. So if you take nothing else away from this, always remember to wear your seat belts. I got out of the car, climbed out of the ditch, and my first thought was to call in late for work. But I couldn't get a signal because of the rain and my location, so I had to walk a little bit further away uh, until I could finally get my manager's voicemail. But at that moment, a cop car sped by with his sirens blaring, and I thought maybe someone had called the police because of the accident, so I didn't leave a message, I just hung up the phone, and I walked back to where I had left my car, only to find that in the time it had taken me to leave and come back, the car had been stolen. <laughs> now, I take responsibility for leaving my keys in the ignition, but in my defense, I had left the car in a ditch. <laughs> but I remember the first thought I had upon recovering from the initial shock was, this is my opportunity. An opportunity to kill myself as far as I was concerned. I just walked away and I was a religious man at the time. One thing that they taught at my church was that suicide is a mortal sin the ultimate act of selfishness, instant damnation. I didn't care. I anticipated going to hell when I died, and that still seemed preferable to living another day. I considered throwing myself into traffic, but worried that I would survive and then just have medical bills that I couldn't pay for. <laughs> <laughs> After another few hours of walking, I came to the bridge. A lot of people, upon surviving a suicide attempt, use that as an opportunity to reflect on why they're trying to kill themselves. Some people take it as a sign that they're meant to live. As I washed up onto the muddy banks of the Raritan River coughing up water, all I thought was, I can't even do this right! <laughs> Fast forward a few years, and I moved to Chicago, but I didn't have a plan. Uh, with the same impetuousness that led me to try and kill myself, I packed as much of my belongings as I could into one suitcase, set up a couple of appointments for apartments on Craigslist, and got on a bus. 
I had no job, no place to live. I knew no one who lived in Chicago. Chicago just seemed like the right place to move to. I stayed at the youth hostel downtown for a night because I arrived really late at night and that was the cheapest room I could find. It cost more to store my bag, so I just brought it with me to each apartment. The first two people I had talked to canceled on me, but the third person and I got along, and I was thankful for that. Uh, he showed me a small room with a twin bed and asked when I would be able to move in. I said, now, and tossed my <laughs> bag on the floor. <laughs> I was now roommates with a professional human guinea pig and his dumpster diving friend. <laughs> For a job, I just went out from the apartment in concentric circles, applying at every place I could find, filling out every application. And eventually, I got to be the manager of a dollar store for $200 cash a week. I didn't keep that job long. I didn't keep that apartment long either. My first year in Chicago, I went through five jobs, four roommates, three boyfriends, and two apartments. Eleven years later, here I am. I don't tell the second part to eliminate the first part. Uh, it's more like they're two sides of the same coin. If I could go back in time and stop myself from jumping off the bridge, I probably wouldn't believe me. And if I could tell myself that everything would work out after moving to Chicago, I wouldn't believe myself then. Either way, now I get to stand in front of a room full of mostly strangers and tell a good story. And for that, thank you. <laughs>